think it's great because your academics don't always have the chance to go down to the beach every weekend to go look for fossils exactly, where yeah. as you know there's probably in my area there's at least probably 10 or 15 people that I know are going out most weekends looking for fossils so you've got this whole team of people just scouring the area for fossils and then letting you know the museums and universities know to find something scientifically um, valuable Hello and welcome to the Wiser Tomorrow podcast. Today I'm speaking with Mornay from Mamlambo Fossils. Mornay is a fossil hunter living on the South Island of New Zealand, searching for Miocene and Cretaceous era fossils and preparing them for donation to museums for scientific research or to schools as educational tools for the next generation of scientists. The Mamlambo channel and social media accounts document his discoveries and inspire others who are interested in fossil hunting or the many disciplines that are behind the hobby. We spoke on many topics, from Mornay's own journey into fossil hunting to how citizen science offers enormous potential to contribute to the field. I hope that you will enjoy our conversation, and if so, please consider liking and subscribing if you're watching on YouTube, or leaving a review if you're just listening on one of your favorite podcatchers. So without further ado, please welcome Mornay from Mamlambo Fossils. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I know it's late for us both, so and on a weekend nonetheless, so it's very much appreciated. No, it's all good. I've just come back from a fossil hunt, actually, so oh, yeah, I'm perfect. feeling pretty relaxed. Yeah, found a nice okay. fossil, so that's always a good way to, to end the day with. Oh, absolutely, and that, that immediately brings me into all the different questions. Uh, I should <laughs> say from the outset, though, that you know I'm an amateur at a lot of the the subjects that I'm that I'm having conversations about this one in particular so if you're an amateur then that makes me a child <laughs> so <laughs> just want to warn you I'm, I apologize if maybe some of the questions are sort of a little low level um oh, I'll no, try to work sort good. of from the ground up okay perfect um so first I would just be curious to hear a little bit more about you and your own background it's from watching your videos it sounds like you haven't necessarily been doing this your whole life. You got into this maybe not too long ago. So what's what's your story? Well, I'll, I'll start where I um, where I grew up in South Africa. As you can tell from my accent, I'm yeah. not uh -huh. Kiwi, maybe. Um, I think I've got a bit of a blend of an accent going on now. But grew up in South Africa. I lived there for the first 34 years of my life and only moved to New Zealand quite late. Uh, late in my life and grew up in a, a small town or probably a city called East London which is a bit confusing but it's uh, in South Africa uh, not a very creative name but that's where the coelacanth was rediscovered in the 1930s so the coelacanth was a uh, lobe finned fish that was thought to be extinct in the Cretaceous period so what 66 million years ago and then one day someone caught it so just off the off the um, coast there in East London. So that was in our museum, and as a young kid, we were always taken to the museum to go have a look at the the coelacanth, and you know told the story. And in the museum was also a dodo, uh, some really old footprints, so from 140,000 year old footprints. And so I was really interested in fossils, but in South Africa, you're not allowed to look for fossils. Uh, because there's really? so many hominid fossils. I think you're allowed to on the beaches. So if something washes up on the beach and it's a fossil shark tooth or something like that, you're allowed to, you know, uh, keep that or take it to the museum. But because there's such a, a abundance of hominid fossils in the caves and, you know, just all over the place, you're not allowed to fossil hunt yourself. So that's kind of where the interest for um, fossil hunting came from. And we were on a family vacation in Israel, actually. And mm. I was near a lut. I think it's a coastal yeah, uh -huh. town in the south. known for, yeah, yeah. And um, I just explored like the hillsides behind our hotel, and really, like 50 meters above sea level, I found all these shells. They were just kind of stuck in the in the mountain. I was like, "What are they doing here?" I was like 15 <laughs> years old. Didn't really know how fossils worked or all that, but you know that got me really interested in looking for fossils. Uh, fast forward like <laughs> 30 years, no, 20 years, and here I am in New Zealand. And on a random beach, I found a, bo a bone, you know, that had turned to stone, a fossil. And it turned out to be from a, a dolphin. 
So that's kind of how I got back into it. And that got me interested to see what fossils are around New Zealand. And it turns out we're in like one of the best places to find fossils uh, here in Canterbury. So there's all mm. sorts of fossils from Miocene up to Cretaceous uh, and also some really good fossil crabs. So that's kind of how I got into the fossil hunting thing. Uh, I've been mm -hmm. doing it, uh, create a YouTube channel. Um, so I've been doing it for about three years now where I've been taking videos and just posting it mainly to show people back home in South Africa what I was up to. And, you know, then a few other people started watching and it kind of just went from there. Sure. And are you staying mostly local within the South Island or in a particular side of the coast? Are you, or are you going all around the country? No. Um, so probably within two hours from my home. So I'm in, you know, in Christchurch. So two hours from Christchurch is where I spend all my time. Uh, there's just such an abundance of places to go look for, mostly along the coast. So I stay on the public land in the rivers and on the coast. And yet there's so much you can find. There's everything from penguins to plesiosaurs, uh, crabs, like I mentioned, shark teeth. There's just all sorts of things. And like you say, I'm a very much an amateur, but there's some great resources in New Zealand. So if I find something cool, I just email uh, the local museums and they get back to you with like in, within a day or two with a oh, guess wow. at what it could be. Um, yeah, and that's just really fun, and it's good to get out there and have a look around. Uh, it's like treasure hunting. You never know what you're going to find. <laughs> yeah, and it, it seems like if you've only been doing it, at least within New Zealand, for a handful of years, and, and you found the type of organisms that are worth donating to these museums, that's a pretty mm. big success, right? That seems like you've developed the skills rather quickly. Um, I think I've been really lucky in some of the things I've found. Uh, like one of the one of the best things I found was a fossil billfish skull. So um, pretty much a marlin skull without the, the tip of the sword, but the whole skull with the eye and everything. And they had these mm -hmm. really cool bony eyes. Um, and that I found, I was on my way to Meraki Boulders and stopped just for a quick uh, break to stretch my legs, walk down to the beach maybe walked 20 meters and I saw something weird. I thought it was petrified wood at first, picked it up. It was about, we'll call it 40 centimeters long. So it was quite a chunky piece and then thought it was a dolphin skull and then posted a few photos on Instagram and someone's like, no, that's a marlin skull. So it turns wow. out to be quite a important specimen as well. So luck sometimes has, you know, something to do with it. But uh, I think the amount of ground I cover, uh, you're bound to find something good. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite part about your videos is the the introduction when you kind of show before you've done any work to it, because from oh, yeah. the completely untrained eye, it's in, it's invisible. You know, one of the questions <laughs> that I was in, even showing my friends some of your videos leading up to this conversation, the question we all had was, it doesn't look any different than anything else. So how do you sort of train your eye to, to pick up on these things? Um, so before I found my first fossil crab, so I, I knew there were fossil crabs around. I kind of knew the rough location and I just kept going down and I didn't know what rocks to look at. So I basically just looked at all the rocks. I looked at the conglomerates. I looked at the, uh, you know, volcanic rocks. I looked at the limestone rocks. Eventually I started finding what rocks they're in. And that was just by pure luck. I found one that had been broken. So the waves had broken the rock apart and you could see the crab. So I picked that up and then literally I would go around the beach with the one in my, <laughs> you know, the one that I know is a crab in my hand. As like a and reference. compare all the other <laughs> rocks. See. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they weird, they concretion. So I don't know if you know how concretions form. No, no. Um, so it's basically the silt from the, the silt cliffs that has been um, cemented together by the calcium carbonate and it's formed kind of like a natural cement. So these concretions erode out of the cliff and they've got the fossils in. So if you know what to look for, they extend out quite a bit and you look for the really round ones. That's usually where the, the crabs are in or the, uh, you know, the birds or the penguins and they, they're all in those kind of rocks. Yeah, that must um, develop. But, sorry, to get back to you. No, you can question, go ahead. How do you know, how do you know there's a, a fossil inside there? So the crabs are easy. They've got those three legs on either side or four legs on either side, mm -hmm. depending on how lucky you are. Um, the penguin that I found recently, I was very lucky in that when I found it on the beach, there were 
I could see a little bit of the leg bone right at the bottom sticking out. And then when I looked to the top where I thought the skull should be, if it was still articulated, the skull was there. So I could tell, okay, this is, I'm pretty sure this is a penguin just by those two little bits of bone sticking out. Um, if you kind of pictured it in your mind, you could see where it would fit together. So I was quite lucky in, in that regard that it was still articulated. If it wasn't articulated, uh, it could have pretty been, much been anything could have been any bird. I, th I was pretty sure it was a bird just based on the size of the bones. It wasn't a whale or a dolphin or a seal because the bones were a little bit too, too small for that. It could have been fish, but it didn't have the look of fish bone to it because fish bone is quite flaky. They've kind of got these layers um, stacked on top of each other where uh, penguins have a little bit of a different texture to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, that being said, it still strikes me as you have to really have quite the keen eye, even even I'm imagining with a few <laughs> years of experience, it sounds very tricky. And uh, before we get any further, I feel like for people like myself who really are, are not in the know in the entire space, um, I think there, what is a fossil might be the, the simplest question, because I know one of the commonest conceptions is that people think most fossils are actually just the, the, the preserved remains. But fossils can also mm. just be an imprint of the organism, correct? Yeah. I think so. Fossils kind of get termed as something older than 50,000 years, but don't quote me on that. That's mm -hmm. kind of when I when I go look at the definition, you get sub fossils and you get fossils. And there's not a, a hard line where something turns from a a bone into a fossil is a gradual process. You know, each molecule gets replaced by a mineral one at a time kind of thing over mm -hmm. a span of uh, years and can happen fast or it can happen quick depending on the environment. Um, but a fossil, as far as I know, the fossil is just kind of the imprint left behind of where the bone was and it's been replaced by minerals. So, and I was actually going to ask you because you've got a chemical background. Mm -hmm. um, so bone is pretty, it's got a lot of phosphorus phosphate in it is it phos yeah it should have a lot I of believe so I believe so mm -hmm. and so when the fossils I work on so you've got the calcium carbonate usually as the host rock and then you've got mm -hmm. calcium phosphate as the bone inside the, the the host rock and I was wondering that calcium phosphate is any of that phosphate left over from the original bone because did it stay in the area and it got reabsorbed into the fossil and I was thinking about it earlier today. I should ask you that, seeing as you've got a, a chemical background. Is that possible? I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, you know, it's it's funny because I should say, I, I will go ahead and speculate on that. But before I do, you know, the way the way the chem education gets broken down is you definitely you go a little bit more the direction of physics or biology. And I guess this is actually a good example of somewhere pretty in between. But I don't think I could give you an, an answer with confidence. I could imagine it sort of either way. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I think anything beyond that would just be pure speculation. So, but that that's something that's definitely enough, I yeah. can look into and get back. I, I was thinking about that today, and how would you actually prove that? <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's um, there's a there's a lot of tricky experiments I could imagine coming up with. There's probably some paper maybe... on it, some obscure paper on it. Yeah, um, surely. So, surely. as far as I understand, the the fossil is the kind of the the mold of where the bone used to be. And it's preserved the texture in most instances, but it's been replaced molecule by molecule um, by a different minerals. So some of the crabs I find have turned into iron pyrite, which is a pain because they get pyrite disease, which is <laughs> oh. kind of when the moisture in the air reacts with the, the, the iron FES, what's that? Iron sulfide. Uh, iron sulfide. Oh and it it turns into sulfuric acid there's some kind of chemical mm. reaction where the iron pyrite turns into uh, sulfuric acid and that kind of just blossoms and goes all yeah. over the fossil and just uh, yeah destroys it so there's definitely a process where it you know it gets replaced but i think the technical definition of a fossil is something over 50,000 years old but you know like i say amateur <laughs> so i could well be wrong on that and you get sub fossils and you get the crossover so i think it's not as clear cut as this is what a fossil is um, and the fossils i find are late miocene or middle miocene so they're roughly in the 12 million year old range that's the crabs i find um 
and a lot of the, the birds and the penguins and the dolphins are kind of in that age. And then the plesiosaurs are obviously going into Cretaceous, so they're roughly 80 million years old. So I would think there's a quite a different process in the fossilization. Sure. And yeah. I, so I often get asked, how do we date the fossils? Um, most of the fossils, when I say they're roughly 12 million years old, that's an estimate based on that area. So we've got maps of the areas that I go into and they'll say this one is late Miocene and it's been dated by looking at the microfossils like the forams or mm. uh, various other techniques. So some really clever geologists have gone through the areas and have kind of mapped it out and said, you know, this is roughly middle Miocene, this is Cretaceous. So it's not, um, as you know, carbon uh, dating, yeah, mm -hmm. because that I think is only up to, is it, is it only a hundred thousand years old or some, somewhere yeah, that something was, whatever like that, the half life yeah. is. Yeah. So you can't carbon date something that's 12 million years old. I'm sure as mm -hmm. most of the listeners know. <laughs> sure. What, well, I, one question I had, and I, I can't really find the right way to ask this is what, what is it about those two periods? Like what, why are these areas filled with fossils specifically from those two periods? Um, is that, is that just because those are the areas you're looking or? Yes, I would say, well, so the Cretaceous area where I was today, actually, if where I parked my car, you start off at Eocene. So roughly in the 50 million year old, then you walk up river and the rivers cut through these layers. So there's, you know, it's getting late, uh, the sediment gets laid down oldest to youngest, mm -hmm. but in some parts, the river has kind of, because there's so many earthquakes and movement in New Zealand, it's not a horizontal line. Every time something gets laid down, things bulge and there's mm. uh, anticlines and all sorts of things going on there. So the, even though the river is relatively flat, the earth that it's going through has been squished and wrinkled and folded. So you might be going from, you know, Eocene into Cretaceous. And where I actually walk today, you walk past the Katy boundary. So where mm. they, where the mass extinction happened between the Cretaceous and is it the Eocene? I wasn't get that wrong. I think it's Cretaceous to Eocene. <laughs> and mm. so you actually walk past that layer where there's more iridium in that layer where they uh, think there was uh, the meteorite, you know, that oh, caused wow. the extinction event. So it's, it's very interesting. And the reason why I'm in the Miocene is just the areas that are accessible to me with lots of fossils is Miocene or Cretaceous. Those are the kind of ones I go to, but there's also Pleistocene. There's also Pliocene. There's all sorts of areas I can go to within like two hours of my house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously you're searching uh, around the coast for the most part, or maybe exclusively, but is it worth uh, pursuing places, you know, for example, like Milford Sound, places that have a, a body of water but isn't actually the ocean? Um, I don't know much about Milford Sound's area. I think Milford Sound is where there's a lot of greenstone, so the Punamu, so that's metamorphic. And I don't think metamorphic stone is great for fossils because it's been smushed up too much. So the mm -hmm. fossils wouldn't be, it's been uh, metamorphosized into a different mineral. So the, the fossils wouldn't have been preserved well. Whereas the area I'm in down into Otago is very sedimentary. So there's some really good layers, limestone layers, mudstone, uh, all those kind of areas where the concretions form. And the concretions are cool because they kind of are like those plaster casts that you put around fossils. Have you seen that mm -hmm. on TV where they, yeah, they kind yeah. of put the plaster around a fossil? So this is kind of nature's way of preserving the fossils. So it looks like cement, but it's actually those concretions that keep them safe from being tumbled up and down the beach. The, the comments I get on my, so when I first put a, um, a prep video out there where I took the crab out of the rock, out of the concretion, I would say about 90% of the comments were people saying that I'd put an actual crab in cement and they're just taking oh. it out of the cement for the, for the YouTube views. <laughs> it's so sad how was... many people are doing that, that it makes you, <laughs> makes people think that you're included. Yes. Yes. I, th I saw recently someone was uh, gluing things onto turtles to try and 
fake rescue them. So, yeah, I, you can see why people think uh, everything on the Internet is fake. But in the past two years, I've seen a massive switch over in the comments where there used to be 90% people saying, oh, you put a crab in cement or that's cement. Now there's, you know, um, people correcting the comments. So that knowledge mm. has certainly spread throughout the Internet that crab fossils can occur in these egg looking rocks. And I guess it's also just you've gotten enough credibility. I guess at the beginning when, you know, it's you have a very small yeah. presence, people are just assume the worst. And then after a while, they go, oh, OK, he, he's for real. <laughs> um, I, I, I thankfully remember that other thought, which was uh, so it sounds like it's mostly about the, the geology of the location, not so much how many organisms or when they existed. So you could have a, a ton of biodiversity and just not the right geology mm. and, and have very little record. Yes. And. I don't know why certain areas have got concentrations of fossils in other areas which are also sedimentary, also from roughly the same area, are not fossiliferous. What's the word? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Something but there's like a lot that. of fossils. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and the conditions also have to be good for fossils to form. And when I say good, I'm glossing over a whole bunch of things that need no to be worries. there. Um, <laughs> I think the area, so one of my my theories of why there's so many fossils in the one area I go to is um, these turbidity currents. So a turbidity current is when you've got something like a slope, so kind of the slope going off into the deep ocean, and let's say an earthquake appear, uh, happens on land or off into the ocean, and the tidal wave comes past you wouldn't really see the effect in the deep ocean, but that tidal wave goes up onto the land, comes back down, brings all that sediment, and you kind of get a current of sediment that then goes down this continental slope, you know, or this I shelf see. down to the deep water, and that's bringing things from the land. So you're bringing in seabirds, uh, penguins, and it's also covering animals that are on the seabed because I was wondering why aren't these crabs and things being scavenged on? How, why am I finding a penguin that is still fully articulated? Mm. And it must have been quite a sudden event that buried uh, these animals down there. And if you actually look at the cliffs, so where I go down onto the beach, if you look back, there's about a hundred meter high, that's 300 foot high cliff. And if you look at it, you can see the concretions are actually forming in layers. So all these marbles, or in the cliff in layers. And that's what I think could be where these turbidity currents had happened, where these earthquakes or some other event had happened at various intervals, because they happening every like meter to three, four meters, you know, there's a gap and then there's a line of concretions and there's a gap and a line of concretion. So I think that's one of the reasons why there's so many fossils in the site um, that I go to, because I mean, on a good day, you can find three or four really good crabs. Uh, perfectly uh, preserved in their little eggs, their little concretions. Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question is how often are you able to actually find uh, a fossil? Because it's hard to tell from the videos whether it's, it's every single time or every few times. It's very rare that I go down and I don't find a fossil that I would like oh, nice. to keep. Um, every time you go down at the, you know, these beaches, you will find a fossil, whether it's a shell, whether it's a, um, a coral, you'll find one. You might not want to keep it because, you know, you've got enough shells or you've got enough uh, half crabs. Uh, every, probably every second or third time you'll find a really perfect fossil. Um, and maybe every tenth time I would find something that I would say is significant, like mm. a bird or a penguin um, or something really good. The, the last really good one I found was about three weeks ago. And I hiked, so I parked my car at the beach and hiked for about four miles down the beach. Didn't find much, mm. found a crab or two, came back and right in front of my car, I found an interesting concretion with a bit of bone sticking out and the bone just looked a little bit weird. So I took it home and started prepping it and it's a turtle skull. So this really big, oh, wow. it looks like uh, the size of, you know, one of these really big loggerhead turtles. So it's about 20 centimeters wide at the base of the skull. So a decent sized turtle skull. Um, yeah, so you just never know where it's going to be. It's going to be, it could be at the furthest point from where you start, or it could be right in front of your car where you're parked kind of thing. 
But do you find that for the most part, it's a bit further from the car park? Because I imagine the fossil yeah. hunters a long time ago already got to everything close by. Well, the the beach changes so much. So there's there's mm. lots of big waves moving in. The sand level can vary by a meter or two every time you go down there. So there's constantly yeah. new things being exposed. And most of the places I go to, it's difficult to get down to the beach. So you can't just... There's one place you can park right in front of the beach, but most of the other places, it's a kilometer or two hiking down a cliff. So there's, there's not a lot of people that go down there. And if you want to take something back, it's a big climb. So I think that naturally keeps things fresh. So there's there's always something down there to have a look at. And how is your own fossil collection looking at the moment? I mean, I imagine <laughs> you might have hundreds at this point, right? I try and give away. So what I do is I go into schools and I'll take a box of fossils and I'll leave them there. Um, oh, nice. Because I kind of, what I try and do is if I find a really good fossil, it will go to the museum. So I found a, um, an albatross like two years ago, which was my first oh, bird. Wow. Um, and it's probably a new species. So that albatross I donated to the museum. Uh, I found wow. some whale ear bones that have been donated to the museum. So I try and donate as much to the museums as possible because I don't have the storage for it. And I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not one to try and hold on to them. Kind of, I kind of I just see. see myself as a caretaker of the fossils. I don't see it as my collection. So I feel really happy to give things to uh, young fossil hunters that write to me. I'll just send it to them if they're in New Zealand because I can't send fossils out of New Zealand without a permit. Um, but yeah, I try and give away as much, but yeah, if I just look around myself now, I can probably see 30 fossils that I'm working on. <laughs> so yeah, it grows quickly and you have to keep an eye on it. Um, so that's why I leave a lot of things on the beach. Like I found some really nice crabs recently and I just kind of left them on the beach for the next person to find because I've got enough crab fossils. Oh, nice. Nice. That's, it's very kind of you. What, what, so when you, when you go out, do you sort of have some expectation of what you're going to find? Cause it sounds like a lot of the detection comes down to having some understanding of the anatomy of the different organisms that are out there. Yeah. So I'll spend quite a bit of time on Sketchfab, uh, looking at 3d models of what I'm interested in. So I'll, I've spent a lot of time looking at penguin fossils and looking mm. at what penguin bones will look like, um, in a concretion or I'll go to the museum and just have a look at what's local around here. So I've got a good idea if when I see it on the beach, uh, I can recognize it as something important and not be like, Oh, you know, I'm not sure what it is. See. I'll just leave it. So I was quite lucky recently. I'd been looking at concretions full of shark teeth quite a bit because that's been on my list to find. And I found a rock and I looked at this rock and it had a very distinct line of things in it. And as I held it to the light, I could see they were glinting and they were kind of hollow. And I could kind of, I could see a little bit on the side there, there was some cartilage, some fossil cartilage. Now fossil cartilage looks quite different to fossil bone. It's almost like paving stones next to each other because they're not connected like bone. They're kind of these little paving stones, but very, very small. And they almost threw out the rock. So I could know, I knew that, okay, there's cartilage here. There's a row of something glinting. This is probably um, some, you know, associated shark teeth. So I could take that, wrap it up nicely, get the GPS coordinates, get it all photographed and videoed just so I've got really good info for when it goes to, you know, into a museum's collection because I knew this was a good find. Finding mm -hmm. articulated shark teeth is very rare. It's, it's quite common finding a shark tooth just by itself because sharks lose probably thousands of teeth over their lifetime. But to <laughs> mm -hmm. find a fossil shark where the, t the teeth are still in position with the kind of the, the cartilage of the jaw there, that's very rare. So, um, yeah, I spend a lot of time researching what it should look like. Um, I spend a lot of time downloading papers, which take me a really long time to read through because I have to Google every second word. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I feel so your pain on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you find something like that, is that any good indication that there's some more samples in the area or are they typically sort of a one-off each time? No, that, that would be a good sign for me that there should be something good. 
or some more good things in the area. Mm -hmm. So once I find, I, I look for clues. So when I go down to a new area, I start looking for shells, like fossil shells, because that's normally the most abundant fossil that I'll find. And if I find start finding fossil shells, then I kind of get an idea of what age it is, because they can be quite good markers for the age of an area. And after I found the fossil shells, if I find a bone, then I'm like, okay, bone has been fossilized in this area because not all areas would fossilize bone necessarily. It might fossilize a lot of uh, shells. And so, yeah, that's kind of how I go. I start trying to figure out an area. It might not happen on the first trip there, but maybe on the second or third trip, you start figuring out where the good fossils will be. But yeah, definitely if you find something like that, you know, okay, this is a place I need to check out. Let me take, let me come back here with four, three or four hours and just have a proper look throughout the area. And is, is the information you sort of collect on the areas also something that you often hand off to researchers and museums? Because that seems equally as valuable as, as the actual samples themselves. Yeah, the museums love talking about context. So mm -hmm. it's no use just handing them a fossil and saying, hey, I found this on the beach. It's a pretty cool penguin. They want to know <laughs> where you found it. When did you find it? Photos of it in situ, all those kind of things. And best of all, if it's still in the original sediment, so if the concretion was kind of being eroded out of the cliff and you could see it and you just picked it up mm. out of the cliff, that's first prize because they know exactly what layer is from. When it's been washed up onto the beach and it's been rolling around for decades, it's a little bit more tricky to kind of get the, the age for it. But if you're lucky, there will be some micro fossils in the concretion. So mm. um, when I prep the fossils, it's very important to not just kind of prep through these little bits of shell. You <laughs> kind of have to, yeah, you kind of have to try and extract the shells out of the concretion that you're prepping. I see. Yeah. So I know, I, yeah, I've, I've noticed many times in your videos, you always make a point to say, you know, this is not for hammering the just chunks of no. rock away from the fossil because yeah and uh, one of the the biggest questions i wanted to make sure to get to uh, because i will forget is what is the <laughs> dream find for you or what are some of the dream finds because i imagine there's a few things where every time you go out you just are like what what if today is the day <laughs> i haven't found a dolphin skull yet i'd love to find a dolphin mm. skull with teeth in it I'd still like to find a megalodon tooth. I haven't found a megalodon tooth. I found all sorts of other shark teeth, you know, great white, so the ancestral, the great white, the, what they call a transitional tooth. So between the great white and the, I think it's the Astalis, I might be wrong on that. But I found those, but I haven't found a megalodon yet. They are in the area. They're very rare here in New Zealand. Then I'd love to find a plesiosaur skull. I haven't found a plesiosaur skull yet, and they can be found, and they're easy enough to carry it. Um, around because they're only the size of a football, you know, some of oh, them. Okay. Um, and anything dinosaur related. So dinosaur fossils in New Zealand are super rare. There's only been a handful found and I don't think there's any been found on the South Island. And really? theoretically wow. they should be around. Yes. So I find Cretaceous wood. And if you think about it, where this Cretaceous wood, why isn't there dinosaur fossils? I've heard a theory that the the soil was too acidic, so it preserved the wood for some reason, but not the bone. But mm. I mean, there must be one or two. There's plesiosaur bones everywhere, you know, in the Cretaceous layers. So there must have been one dinosaur that did the, uh, fl what's it, bloat and float off, off mm -hmm. the yeah. coast and got deposited. So I'm hoping for that dinosaur, dinosaur fossil. And then how about some of the, the animals that are sort of unique to New Zealand that are, are distantly distinct, uh, extinct? I think one, one that comes to mind, and I, hopefully I'm not going to butcher the name, is a, a moa, right? The, yeah. It's a prehistoric moa. bird, a very large. So is that, is that on the table as well, or are we talking about just a totally different area or, or time period? No, you find moa bones pretty much throughout New Zealand. They, they're mm -hmm. not uncommon. There's one area in Canterbury called... Uh, it's Pyramid Valley. There was a swamp, and it's just got hundreds of mowers in this swamp. Wow. They're not sure, quite sure why they're all there, but it's um, maybe a fire drove them into the swamp or something similar. But there's literally hundreds of mowers, uh, skeletons in the swamp. And from time to time, you find them washed up on the beach. So they erode out of, there's a Miocene cliff, and then on top of the Miocene cliff, there's a 
Pleistocene, so roughly 100,000 year old layer, and that's got moa bone in it, and every now and again that erodes onto the beach and it washes up. And those ones I try and just donate to the museum. Um, I don't have moa myself, moa bones myself. I try and just uh, donate them to the museum so they can be studied further because I think they're doing a DNA project on them. And I think you can extract DNA from bones that age oh, wow. if you're lucky, I think, yeah. So, yeah, and um, they're quite distinctive. So the tarsal metatarsus, the ankle bone, or what I call the ankle bone, is very similar to that of a dinosaur. So if you imagine where the three toes of a T-Rex join onto the ankle, it's a very similar bone to that. And how I wanted to get to some of the relationships you have with the museums and how, how they are either happy or maybe a little standoffish working with the amateurs. And I know this is something you've talked about on your own channel. Do you find that people are typically very excited to hear from you or do they have a sort of a sitting in their ivory tower type of attitude? No, no. Everyone I've encountered here yeah, in New Zealand have been great to work with. I mean, I ask silly questions all the time, and I think I cringe when I think back to when I started and I <laughs> sent photos of just the most random rocks to the museum saying, hey, what did I find? I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's just a rock. So they've been great. Um, all the museums I've worked with in uh, New Zealand have been great. I've worked with Otago University, Canterbury uh, Museum and Te Papa Museum, and they've all been really great. And I've emailed people at Auckland Museum. They've all been awesome to work with, and they they're not standoffish or uh, they're not they're not worried about talking to amateurs at all. They've always have time for that. I feel so. And I've I've pointed a few people every now and again. Someone will find something great, and then email me saying I I found this at one of the local beaches. What is it? I'm like that's actually really good. You should get in touch with the museum. And a few times they were worried that the museum would take it from them. And I'm like, no, they, they won't take it from you. They'll be very interested. And if it's really scientifically important, they might ask you, can we study it further? Uh, so a lot of people have actually found scientifically significant uh, specimens, got in touch with me, and I've been able to point them to the museum. And that's, you know, that's just created more relationships across the amateur fossil hunters in New Zealand. It seems like fossil hunting is sort of the ultimate example of citizen science because it really is, it's not just for, you know, making people who are involved with it sort of feel good. There's really a potential to contribute quite massively, especially at scale. So I'm surprised there aren't more programs being, being initiated to help facilitate the amateurs uh, contribute as much as they can. Do you know if there's, if there's any work of that kind going on? Um, not in New Zealand that I know of. I know there is at the, I think it's a Charleston museum in the States. I think they've got a really good program where they do some outreach work. Uh, Bobby Busenecker does a lot of work there with some amateur fossil hunters and there's some really great fossil hunters, I think in Oregon that mm -hmm. work Sounds very right. closely <laughs> with, yeah. And they've actually got very similar fossils to what we have in New Zealand. If I just look at the, the cetacean, fossils. So they work really well with the museums there. And there's been some great finds there from the amateurs that have been making their way into museums and papers being written on that. And I think it's great because your academics don't always have the chance to go down to the beach every weekend to go look for fossils. Exactly, whereas, yeah. you know, there's probably in my area, there's at least probably 10 or 15 people that I know are going out most weekends looking for fossils. So you've got this whole team of people just scouring the area for fossils and then letting, you know, the museums and universities know to find something scientifically um, valuable. And they start knowing the areas very well. So I know, you know, if there's been this kind of tide, I should go to this beach. If it's been that kind of weather, I should go to this area. So you start knowing the area so well, whereas, someone that has to look after the whole of Canterbury, um, at, mm -hmm. you know, from a museum, they're not going to have that local knowledge. So it's, it's very good that they can rely on us to go and find the fossils for them and spend all the man hours dragging it off the beach, up the hill. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm, I was thinking is you think they'd be sort of almost begging you or doing everything you can to keep putting in that work. Cause it's hard work. And like you said, they're spread way too thin to be out there on the beach all the time. 
So yeah. it, it sounds like there's a, a really tight knit community within the, the fossil hunting world. That's what I, I see. It sounds like from from our conversation so far, and as well as again watching your videos and kind of digging around through the space. The, I mean, there's it's like any <laughs> it's like any community. You'll have uh, there will be a little bit of competition between sure. <laughs> fossil hunters, <laughs> and there will be some people that would not donate to museums so that you'll find the odd fossil hunter that just won't he won't tell anyone about what he finds yes (laughs) yes they'll want to keep it for themselves or they'll they might think that the museum will just go put it in the storeroom and forget about it because i'm sure that's happened in the past you know um so i would say 80 90 percent of the fossil hunters that i know work very closely with museums and are happy to donate things to have them written up in papers and would love to see things being written up and uh, published. That's really awesome to hear because I've seen comments on your own videos, for example, of people from the UK and a few other places sort of saying the opposite, finding that a lot of the scientists and quote unquote, the professionals really just won't give them the time of day. And it's, it's to the detriment of everybody. Yeah, that's, that's not great to hear. And I always wonder how did it get to that state? You know, what, what happened there? Is it, is it just someone said the wrong thing or missed an email or, you know, I'm sure every paleontologist I've, or geologist I've ever encountered has been super interested in local finds. I mean, that's why they do what they do. They are interested in the things being found. So I always wonder, you know, how did it get to that state? And one thing that makes you different than a lot of the amateurs is you're recording and documenting all of this and sharing it with the general audience. And, and one thought that I crossed my mind is that might that must add somewhat of an element of stress because, I mean, at the end of the day, you're hoping to produce content on it. So if you go out or you go out many times and you find a few things here and there but don't find anything that you consider substantial, do you feel you need to stay out there longer? Is that something that weighs on you? No, I'm I'm very lucky in this it's just a hobby. So you get content yeah. creators where this is their full-time job. This is not my full-time job. You know, if I, sometimes I'll leave my camera at home and be like, ah, oh, today I can't be bothered filming. I just want to go explore new areas or it's going to be too heavy. I'm just going to leave it. And mm-hmm. you know, I'll just take a photo if I find something cool. So I don't feel stressed at all. Um, I don't feel like I have to manufacture excitement. Good. Um, Good. (laughs) Yeah. So I I don't feel any of that stress luckily. And I think I'm quite fortunate in that regard. You know, if I, if the YouTube, I mean, YouTube could (laughs) shut down my account tomorrow. I mean, and I mean, that would not be great, but it's not the end of my world. (laughs) I'll still find a way to do what I enjoy. And I, I've always got, I mean, if I look around me, I've probably got another four or five years worth of things to prep. So I could always just do prep videos. <laughs> You're good for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got enough things to prep. <laughs> and in a perfect world, I guess, because the channel, I think, has grown pretty dramatically, especially recently. I feel like every time I went back to your channel over the last week or two, it was spiking by several thousand subscribers. And I know you're also on TikTok and Instagram. So Is this something that you at least maybe hope is a full-time thing one day? Or is that not even something you're interested in? I mean, I wouldn't say no to being a full-time fossil hunter. It sounds like a great... (laughs) Sounds pretty good, right? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it sounds pretty pretty awesome. I do worry that it will take away the the fun. You know, as soon as something Mm -hmm. becomes your job, sometimes it becomes, uh, like you say, there's some pressure now on you to produce uh, good content. Am I going to start... Uh, having to place fossils on the beach and be like, yeah, oh, look yeah. what I just found. You Check know, kind it out. Of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> um, so I would I would think, so I'm going back to university this year to get my, hopefully my BSc. Oh. Um, nice. Because I did a commerce, I started a commerce degree for some reason and I can't imagine myself doing accounting again. <laughs> Um, So, yeah, I'm going to try and get my commerce, sorry, my BSc, Mm -hmm. and then hopefully one day get to the level where I can start writing papers on the things I find myself. Um, And I don't know what will happen. I mean, it's my, (laughs) I I honestly don't know. I'm not going into it with the idea of making money and doing it full time because I think that's a lot of pressure. If it does happen, like I say, that'd be awesome. But I'd rather see myself as 
this will enable me to maybe go on a month long fossil trip once a year where I can use the YouTube ad revenue to either uh, subsidize that or buy new equipment. And that's what I've been using it for at the moment. So all my air scribes and that I pay for with my ad revenue from YouTube, nice. which can vary month to month as much as YouTube likes you or not. And yeah, for some reason, my channel's doing well at the moment. So I think once you hit 100,000 subscribers, YouTube does something to your <laughs> channel and probably just sends a bit more traffic to you. But I think it's mainly that penguin video I made got like 25 million views on YouTube and that just drove That's a lot crazy. of subscribers. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, can, I can imagine. And hopefully it was a, a, at least a nice bit of funding for the entire project, I imagine, with 25 no, million no, views. No, because it's, it's a YouTube short, so they only start funding oh. it from the 1st of February. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so okay. I didn't get anything for that. <laughs> That's so... Oh, but well. but the, the main video did very well as well, right? Yeah, like yeah, the full length video, video did well. No, but mm -hmm. imagine 25 million views monetized. <laughs> that would be <laughs> very nice. Great, I think you... Go yeah, ahead, Jeff, sorry. you could have made a nice trip <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, very long trip. And and uh, exactly what I was going to ask next is, uh, have you had the chance to do a lot of fossil hunting anywhere else outside of New Zealand? Is that something you hope to do or have done? I would I would love to do it. So I would love to just hop over to Australia and have a look there. Um, if I do, I've told myself, if I ever do go fossil hunting in another country, I'll leave the fossils there. So I don't want to go to another country and fossil hunt and then try and bring the fossils out. Sure. I kind of feel the fossils have to stay where I find them. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to go to Australia because they've got some cool dinosaur bones that I'd love to see. And love to see where they do the, the opal mining and where they find yeah. those opal uh, bed of nights. I'd love to see one of those, even if it's just in a museum. So definitely Australia because it's so close. I'd love to just shoot over there and have a quick look around. Um, I did do a little bit of fossil hunting in South Africa when I was scuba diving. So on the Alavol Shoal, uh, which is off the coast of Durban, it's about three or four kilometers off the coast, which is the old sand dune system where there's a lot of coral reefs growing on now. And out of these sand dunes, uh, there's some shark teeth that erode. So every now and again, you would find an old a fossil shark tooth. And some people find some really nice big ones. So that's the only fossil hunting I can think of that I've done outside of New Zealand is a little bit of random scuba diving fossils. Mm. And is there sort of a fossil hunting mecca in a certain way? Is there a few pl a place or a few places that is just known for having sort of readily available and incredible finds? I think the the Florida Meg teeth, mm. you know, that they keep finding in those creeks, that looks really fun. And they find yeah. all those. I think they're from the Pleistocene. So from the ice age, they're not, they're not very old, but they look amazing. The ones that they find there. So I think mm -hmm. that's probably <laughs> for me, the, the ultimate goal is go there and just find my Meg tooth. Mm -hmm. And wade through the, the crocodiles though, right? Or the yes. alligators. <laughs> alligators. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I've also heard Antarctica's got some amazing fossils, a little Ooh. bit more difficult mm -hmm. to get to. And sure. then obviously <laughs> you've got, yeah, you've got Morocco, um, once again, uh, I don't think you're allowed to export fossils out of Morocco and, Ant and Antarctica, so you'd kind of leave the fossils there. But that would be amazing to kind of just go look for fossils there. But uh, in my mind, I think New Zealand is very well placed for being a fossil hunting mecca. There's some really good places you can go to to look for fossils. It, it certainly, certainly seems like it. And uh, I imagine you have a lot of people probably specifically from New Zealand, but from across the world who are reaching out, sort of looking to get into fossil hunting, but don't really know where to mm. start. So for anyone who is interested, what, how do you advise getting started? What's the starter starter kit? Yeah, I get asked that quite, probably like daily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first thing I do is, so let's say I lived in, I'm trying to pick a random country, Brazil. Let's say I lived in Brazil and I wanted to get into fossil hunting. So I'd firstly look for sedimentary rock your limestone, siltstone, sandstone. And then what I would do is join a local rock club. Most places have a, a rock club or a geology club because they will know where the fossils are. But you want those sedimentary rocks. You want to look for papers. So I go onto all the, the websites where you can find scientific papers and I would go search for Brazil 
fossils and I'll just start looking through all those places. Um, Brazil might be a bad example, but if you're in the States, there's probably a lot more resources to find it. And I'll also go to my local museum or university and just say, hey, where can I go find some fossils? What do I do if I find a fossil? Because most places would like you to, if it's a vertebrate fossil, they would like to know about it probably. Uh, invertebrates like your crabs and uh, shells sometimes are a lot less um, scientifically valuable just because they're a bit more common. But your vertebrate fossils, if you find a turtle or a whale or a dolphin, they'd probably like to know about it. It's the, one of the biggest questions that strikes me is once you've found the fossil, after, after getting that far in the process, watching you do the, I'm not sure if it, the preparatory work is the right way to put it, but yeah. actually sort of revealing the fossil seems like one of the most challenging parts as somebody who's trying to be self-taught. So how do you go about doing that whole part of the process? So I started out using a Dremel 290 electric engraver. That's what I started out on prepping a crab. And what I did is, well, firstly, I started on the wrong crab. It was a very tricky crab to prep. So I stopped. <laughs> so I got a bit discouraged on that. And then I started just prepping a broken crab. And that was a lot easier. So I prepped three or four broken crabs. And I learned a little bit each time. And I realized that my little electric engraver wasn't going to cut it because it kept mm. overheating and I'd have to stop and wait half an hour for it to, and eventually I had two. So I would swap between the two, one overheat was overheating. I swapped to the other one, but then I got into the pneumatic, uh, air scribes. So I got a very cheap one off, I think it was Amazon or eBay, but I got a really cheap, uh, pneumatic engraver. And I used that one for about two years. And it's just a matter of going really, really slowly. So I've only now with this penguin, the penguin was the first fossil that is potentially a new species that I felt comfortable prepping before, mm -hmm. you know, so it's taken me three years to get confident enough to get to this stage. But yeah, so I practiced on broken fossils firstly, and then I started getting into the acid prepping, which is a lot less forgiving. So with the air scribe, the worst you're going to do is you're going to gouge a fossil or a bone. And it's going to leave an ugly mark, which, you know, it happens, uh, especially when you're starting out. It happens a lot less now, luckily. But with <laughs> vinegar, if you do something wrong and you come back, that if you leave it in too long and there's a lot less of the fossil left, you can't really put it back in there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, that took me a, a lot longer to get comfortable with. So I had to learn about buffering the solution. So mm. uh, with your chemistry background, you'd know that, you know, if you buffer the solution, it will, won't attack the phosphate so much because it's, what's the word for when it's, it's not satiated, but saturated it's, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, saturated. So it's saturated mm. with phosphate. So if you've put a lot of phos calcium phosphate into your acid, the bone won't get attacked as much as the calcium carbonate rock. So you have to learn all those things. You have to learn about B72 paraloid, which is the coating I put on. So it's used by, uh, cons, Conservators, conservators, I think is the, the term for people that work in museums and take care of the collections. So B72 is something, it's like these plastic pellets that you mix with acetone and you can brush that onto the fossil bone where you don't want the acid to go. So mm -hmm. you learn about all those things and it's a very slow process. That penguin I did, I think I did almost 60 rounds of acid to get it where it is. So it's Whoa. putting it on in the acid. So acid is just vinegar. So between five and 10% vinegar. So you put in acid for two, three hours, and then you have to put it in fresh water for three times the amount. So it's nine hours in fresh water and you have to cycle the fresh water to get all the vinegar oh, wow. out. So it's a very long process, but you get amazing results because what you don't want to do with a, like the penguin, the rock wasn't flaking away from the bone very nicely. It was sticky. So what I did is I would just go down to the last half a millimeter of rock covering the bone with my air scrub. And then I put in the vinegar to dissolve that last little bit of the bone. I see. I see. And how long, what's the timeline or for the, the scribe portion? Because I mean, with the acid, if you're doing several hours soaks and then tripling that in yeah. water, it's months, but just the time yeah. you're actually working with the scribe, is it tens of hours still? So the, the really large crab I did was all scribe work. And that was about 200 hours of air scribe work. The penguin was about a hundred hours of scribe work and the rest was just acid. So you, you're talking about for a small crab. 
because you can't use acid on uh, crabs because the shells also calcium carbonate. It's mm -hmm. not got it's calcium not right phosphate. <laughs> Yeah, it just it dissolves at the same rate as the rock, so you you're not gonna mm -hmm. get any gains there. So you just use the air scribe or micro air abrasion. But yeah, for a medium sized crab, you're probably looking at thirty or forty hours until it's done. On the one wow. side, if you're doing both sides, you just double it. And if you do the the bottom of the crab, the dorsal side, no, the ventral side of the crab, it's a lot more complex. There's a lot more little bits you have to clean out than the, the dorsal part of the crab, the top. And in terms you alluded to, you know, spending some of the money you're making from this whole project on upgrading the equipment, what tools would you sort of hope to have? Is it just a matter of having a nicer scribe or are there entirely different sets of tools you'd love to have your hands on? So the last tool that I needed to kind of complete my process to this point was the micro air abrasion which I've just got with my, so I've got a Patreon channel and they um, support me in that way to buy some of these equipment or some of the tools. So the micro air abrasion I bought with my Patreon subscription over two or three months. So now I've got the, I've got a set of air scribes. So I've got a very fine one that you use under a microscope called a micro jack from Paleo Tools. Then I've got a medium sized one that I use most of the time. And I've got a really large one that you use two hands for. And I, I needed something in the middle of those two. So that's probably the next thing I need to aim at um, to get is that, that in between air scribes. So uh, that I can see. remove bulk rock. But the micro air abrasion was the big one. And that's the thing I'm going to try and get better at now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sort of in the same vein, but a, a verging a little bit into the content creation side of, of this whole thing is it looks like from where you're sitting now, this is your workspace. This is this is yes. a, a workshop that you have dedicated to to all of this? Yep, this is half of my double garage. So I've just converted it into uh, my workshop. And I've got like a, on my right hand side here, I've got my a little room within a room and that's my dust proof area. So the air scribes in there and I've done a little bit of soundproofing so my neighbors don't go crazy from there the high pitched whine of an air sure. scribe because it sounds like a dentist straw. It's not the most pleasant sound. That's why I've got a lot of music playing in my videos as well. <laughs> um, and then I've got, yeah, uh, then I've got a few, um, little workbenches where I can do, you know, just some of my videos and I've got two microscopes set up on the left hand side. Oh, sorry. On my right hand side. And mm -hmm. I've got a 3d printer on the left and a 3d scanner. So, that's the other side of what I do is creating the 3D models uh, that people can then download and print their own. So that's one of the things I love is people in the States or in the UK printing out my models. Mm -hmm. So rather than me having to give them their own fossils, they can just uh, 3D print my fossils that I've scanned. The whole thing is just so interdisciplinary. I mean, it really does touch on so many different subjects and disciplines. Is is that a very complicated aspect? Because again, I have no experience with any of that and I could see it being as easy as click a button, let it scan, but I imagine <laughs> not. No, it's the, the 3D scan, it takes a little bit of time to get used to and the photogrammetry as well. So the photogrammetry gives you amazing results and photogrammetry is where you take a 360 degree photos of your subject and then your computer does a whole bunch of complicated math and spits out a really detailed model at the end and does look amazing, but it takes four or five hours to do. Whereas with the 3D scanner, you put it on a turntable and it can do it in 10 minutes. Not as high a quality texture, but it's something very accurate that people can print out. Um, but yeah, you need, well, I'm a, I'm a bit of a geek. So I love, I love, um, <laughs> all sorts of gadgets. So I enjoy playing around yeah. with them and I'm a software engineer. As that's my day job. Oh, I see. So I'm quite confident uh, being able to delve into the code and I've created a few programs. So my fossil workflow um, is all custom. So when I'm out in the field, I can take a photo of my fossil. It attaches the GPS coordinates. It then emails it to myself. A program at my home computer picks that up gives it a unique number, catalogs it, and then takes the GPS coordinates and encodes them. So even if someone got my database without the key, you can't view where That's it was amazing. found. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's a bit of a overkill, I think, but 
what what it allows me to do is by the time I get home, my computer at home has uploaded all my photos to my website and I can choose which ones I put public or not. So, mm. and then when I get home, um, as I get out of the car, I then give each of my fossils a unique number because when you find a lot of fossils, you think you're going to remember where you find them, but yeah, it, quickly you lose track of where you found certain fossils and they all kind of start looking the same when they in concretions. <laughs> so, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really, it's a game changer having that all done. So I don't have to manually at night go and upload photos, put the GPS coordinates in there. That's all done. And that's also part of the fun, though. I mean, I suppose, yeah, sure, it could be considered overkill, but that's <laughs> the nature of the hobby, right? It's just optimizing yes. it and, and playing with it from every angle. So I think that's awesome. Um, and also I'll... it makes it really easy for um, when, so every couple of months, some paleontologists from the museums come past my workshop area here and my collection area and they take the fossils they want and I'm very happy for them to take it. Nice. And as they, as they take them, I just look at the number and I can just quickly print out the info for each of those ones they take and just give it to them. It's got they probably when it was love found, that. where it was found. Yeah, they, they do. And it's got <laughs> photos of it in situ. It's got the, the link to the video. So if I've made a video of it, it's got the video of it so, or the prep the time left so it's got all that built into it you are the perfect ambassador for for being an amateur fossil hunter because again i think that <laughs> does help to give a lot of credibility to people doing this and and showing that it's not just a matter of people taking sure at the beginning maybe you don't know quite much so much yet you take a photo you harass them and it turns out to be a rock but at the end of the day yes. there's a lot of people <laughs> like yourself who really know what they're talking about. And again, I believe very strongly in the idea of citizen science. And I think we should be doing so much more to enable people like yourself to incorporate into sort of the mainstream research. Yeah. And if I look at, so I can go through a bunch of the, the specimens that have been newly discovered in this area. And I would say 95% of them were found by amateurs very very few new specimens are found by uh, professional paleontologists because they mm -hmm. i don't think they've got the time they've got a lot of they've got to manage collections they've got to do outreach they've got to write papers you know i can just go and look for fossils and prep them if i want to <laughs> it's so awesome it really is um I'll, I'll leave you with one final question just as we come up on time I, one of the videos um, that I actually missed somehow, but was, again, in preparing for our conversation, stumbled back upon, was only, I think, a, a month ago, maybe a bit more, which was effectively your own podcast with, and forgive me, I, I cannot remember the professor's name. It was a professor, I believe, in paleontology um, somewhere at a university within the South Island, and you had a bit of an interview with him. And that was amazing. And it seemed like everyone else was in agreement in the comments. So are you planning to do some more of that? I'm, I'm very keen to do that. So that one was on kind of the, the back of, there was a little bit of, um, I wouldn't say controversy, but there was a little bit of, um, yeah, you could probably say it as controversy where a fossil hunter, amateur fossil hunter removed a, a fossil from an area where they weren't really, they, they removed it from an area where it was a much beloved local fossil. People used to take their kids there to look at it. They removed it by cutting it out of the bedrock. So it wasn't a loose rock. And I thought, you know, let me, let me go chat to Dr. Nick Rollins. Um, and he's from Otago university and he's a, he's a mm -hmm. great, very knowledgeable paleontologist. And he wrote a very good blog article about the ethics of fossil hunting. And I thought this is the perfect person to chat to, um, there's a lot of local and not local international fossil hunters watching my channel. So I thought this would be a great way to just kind of share that knowledge. So that's kind of what got that going and I kind of enjoyed it. So I'm looking for the next person to chat to. So I'll, I'll have a look around it. Who's willing to do that. Um, it's not something I'm used to and not something I thought I would do. And randomly one of our local news channels also got in touch Oh, wow. on the back of on, yeah on the back of that uh, fossil that got removed and so i was on our national tv <laughs> uh here in new zealand and they asked me a few really hard questions i thought i was going mm. into a friendly interview but they 
kept trying to get a sound bite. You know, what do I think of this person? I'm like, well, I don't really know this person. You know, I don't know what they were up to. But yeah, so it's it's tricky because the news always wants a really controversial bit of news that they can get people mm -hmm. riled up and angry. Whereas, you know, most people are really wanting to work with museums. They're wanting to donate fossils to museums and see them written up. So yeah, I thought this was a great time to get the other side of the story out there, um, where 95% of, of the people are working together with the museums to find cool things and get it into the hands of scientists that can write it up. I think this, this entire this entire field, I guess we can call it, is really amazing. And this has been so informative because, again, I, I this is something I'm embarrassed to say I know very, very little about. If, and I'll extend that not just to fossil hunting but to geology, to paleontology, to all of the disciplines that sort of build <laughs> on, on fossil hunting. So for me, this has been massively informative. And, you know, the way I started trying to approach this podcast is just – if I identified something fascinating, and especially if I don't know much about it, I just want to want to ask these questions. So I very much appreciate you taking the time. And if you're interested, I would love to follow up maybe in a few months and we can have another conversation, talk about some of your finds between now and then. It'd be my pleasure. I'd love that. I'd love that, Tyler. It was really great chatting to you. And this is my first ever podcast, I think. Uh, I've done one podcast that was only on YouTube, but I don't think it gets published as a, a podcast. And I've really mm. enjoyed the rest of your podcasts. I've been listening to them as I prep fossils. So I've really enjoyed it. And the recent one about life in, you know, what was that? that comet life that in the universe, maybe? Solar. Oh, Amuamua. Yeah. yeah, that was so good. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> That makes me very happy, and I, I don't need to tell you, hearing that is one of the most satisfying and motivating things, just because, you know, the, the idea of you in your workshop making videos that I will later watch while listening to podcasts <laughs> that I've helped produce is just, it's really a beautiful thing. It's, it's, it's very exciting for me, so I appreciate you sharing that.